Verse 15. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphantly over them. The devil, with his demons, had a plan. And the Lord defeated that plan. The devil wanted everyone to worship him instead of God. That was his plan. He wanted worship. But Jesus, by what he did, by raising from the dead, he showed triumphantly destroying the plan of the devil. That's what he did here. And having spoiled principalities and powers, which that's what the devil has right now. Because as we know, the Bible tells us right now he's the prince and power of the air. So Jesus defeated him, defeated his plans. Verse 16, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new, new moon or of the Sabbath days. The word therefore. Like I said before, when you read the scriptures and it says wherefore, therefore, understand why it says therefore. Right here, the therefore means means we are complete in him we have salvation in him forgiveness and victory in him that's what we've been reading in the verses above and he's saying therefore since we have this he says don't let any man judge you because we have been judged by the Lord already we have been judged to be right with him so he's saying because you are complete in me don't let any man judge you do not do not sacrifice your freedom in Christ for a set of man-made rules. And believe me, the churches have many. We have many man-made rules. We have many traditions in the church. In Galatians 5.1, it says, It is because of Jesus we have been set free. Because of Jesus. Not by these commandments from the church. I'm not talking about biblical stuff. I'm talking about the, the traditions of men that are in the church. And he says, so keep standing firm and don't let man bring you under their laws or traditions. I have to emphasize this a lot because that's what's happening in our church. We're letting it creep into the church. We have some, some churches that uh, the pastor have, it needs to become a shepherd. A shepherd would not allow these things to come in. Jesus was a shepherd over us and he protected us. And that's what our pastors should be doing. They should be aware of the philosophies of men that come into the church, like the, the like the positive thinking, and we should never talk about anything that's that's negative. That's that's of man. And the traditions, people are more loyal to their traditions in the church than they are to the Lord. I once preached in the Baptist church, and I was preaching on Hebrews four twelve, on how powerful and and alive how quick the word is and I also preached about you know it's biblical if you want to lift your hands in the church to the Lord if the spirit moves you it's biblical to do it and the whole the whole sermon was on that well after the sermon I had one of the deacons come up to me and he says I agree with everything you preached just now but I'm a deacon here and I can't do that so you see what I'm talking about they're putting tradition of men or judges putting the church, loyal, they're more loyal to the church than they are the Word of God. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. Romans fourteen seventeen, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. So the Lord's saying right here, the kingdom of God is not what you eat, is not what you drink. He says, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. This is the kingdom of God, that you have the righteousness of the Lord the peace of God, the joy of the Lord in you, and the Holy Spirit. That's what the kingdom of God is. Don't let man bring you under bondage again by saying you can't eat or drink on a certain day or not at all. That's just putting you under bondage again. The Lord has freed us from that. Right here, this verse says that the kingdom is not what you eat or what you drink. Let's read the scriptures. Let's read the scriptures and go by the word of God. And what the Lord says in the Old Testament, the Sabbath day. It talks about the Sabbath day up here in the verse. Well, in the Old Testament, the Sabbath day was a, was a day of worship. It says that God rested on the seventh day after creation, and then he made it holy. And that's Genesis 2-3. The Sabbath was a sign for Israel to keep it holy 
and a day of rest. In the Old Testament book, we can find that in Exodus 31, verses 16 and 17, Nehemiah 9, 14, and Ezekiel 20, 12. We'll talk about how this Sabbath was for Israel. Now in John chapter 5, verses 8 through 16, it speaks about a man who had been sick for 38 years, and Jesus healed him. Now the Jewish leaders were offended by this because he had done it on the Sabbath day. And Jesus told them that his father was constantly doing good and that he does the same as his father. Jesus, the Lord, did not have a day off of not healing. And so this is what Jesus was telling them. Jesus didn't break God's law here. He broke the, the laws of the Jewish leaders. It was their tradition not to do anything, nothing, no kind of work on the Sabbath day. Again, this was a tradition of the Jews. If you, if you would read Hebrews chapter 8, you will find that we are not required to keep this commandment. Like I said before, because it was for Israel. The New Testament doesn't speak about us keeping this commandment. Paul wrote most of the New Testament. And he warned us about many different sins in his letters to the churches. And you can't find where he said that keeping or breaking the Sabbath was a sin. That we, nowhere, nowhere in the New Testament does it say that. But we have people who go around saying, this is the day you worship the Lord. But to tell you, to tell you the truth, people, every day is the day we worship the Lord. There's not a day where you should worship the Lord more on that day than any other day. Every day is the Lord's day. Every day. And we need to remember that. So right here is showing you, don't let man tell you what you can eat or drink or what day you should worship. This is all from men. Verse 17. Which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. The way we're living now for the Lord and the things we do is, ju is just a shadow of reality. One day we'll be with the Lord the real reality of our future. Things that we do now and the things we see the Lord doing in our lives now, it's just a shadow of what's to come. When we get to heaven, that's going to be life. That's going to be the true reality. Living with our Lord. Praise God. Praise God for that. We think Christians who are walking with the Lord now, we're blessed. Christians who are walking with the Lord right now, we are, we are very blessed. But I'm going to tell you right now, this ain't nothing to compare to when we'll go to be with the Lord. Amen. Verse 18. Let no man beguile you of your reward and of voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, mainly puffed up by his fresh, fleshly mind. There are religions out there that teach that you are not good enough. You're not good enough to understand the scriptures. And there's religions out there that say that you have to be taught by a teacher, by their teacher, the scriptures. They will not allow the regular members to read the Bible. So they have teachers who have Bible studies in the homes, and they teach what the Word of God says. And right here, it's saying, and it also says that we need not to pray to angels or saints. This is not biblical. Saints, for those of you who don't know, saints are Christians. There's religions out there who have certain certain people that are saints. They're saints. We're not saints. But they have certain men and even some women who they who they call saints. Well, again, this is of men. We're not to recognize certain men within the religion as being special because you can't learn on your own. This is what they're telling you. Because you cannot learn on your own. So they're special. They're the only they can teach you. Who teaches us the Word of God? The Word of God comes to us through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit reveals to us what the Bible says. Oh, we have teachers. We have teachers. But this is, this is a gift. And we do need teachers. But you can be born again without a teacher. And you can study the Bible. It's going to take you a little, a little longer to understand it. But you can do it without a teacher. But it's good to have one. And the Lord gave us teachers. But Christian people do not tell you, 
Don't read the Bible because you won't understand it. That is not that is not from Christians. That is not from a church of God. Men who tell you you cannot read it, that is wrong. We can read it, and the Lord does interpret it to us because of the Holy Spirit that we have that's living in us. We don't need man to do it. We don't need to pray to angels or to saints. Because First Timothy two five says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So, I mean, do, do people not read their Bible? Well, there's some religions, yeah, like I just said, they don't read their Bible. And these men, I'm sure they skip over this verse right here. But there's only one that you pray to. There, it, nowhere in the Bible does it say to pray, angel, to pray to angels or to saints. It says there's only one that can take our prayers and give them to the Lord. And that's the man, Christ Jesus. That's what this verse says right here. If you're praying to anybody or anything else besides Jesus Christ, your prayer is going nowhere. This is the word of God. Not a woman and not a bunch of saints. It's only one. That's it. Period. Just one. Jesus Christ. Verse 19. And not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increases with the increase of God. Right here is talking about these traditions of men, these men who do this. He said they're not being led by the head, which, which is Jesus. As we read in chapter 1 verse 18, that Jesus is the head of the church, the body. And right here it says they're not holding the head as being the one to go to. So these men who tell you there's other, other ones to pray to or other ways to get there, don't listen to them. These men who teach this, they have a different doctrine from the word. Paul says to be aware of them and not to be intimidated by them. As the church, we are to be strong in the Holy Spirit. But I hate to say this, but we have a lot of weak believers because they are being led astray by this by these kind of teachings. So, Christians, those of you who are Christians that are listening to this CD, read the Word of God. Read the Word of God. Know, understand what the Word of God says. So when you have men who come to you and say, oh, well, you know, you can't do this or you're supposed to do this and it don't line up with, with what you've read, praise God. You'll know what's right and what's wrong. You'll know that this is, uh, is he's either a wolf well, he's a wolf, or he's a lost person. Well, they're both the same, wolves and lost men. They're the same. They're not living for the Lord. They're not preaching or teaching the Word of God. John 15, verses 4 and 5 says, Live in me as I live in you. We can't be Christ-like if we don't live in him, and he doesn't live in us. How can we be Christians? He says, Live in me as I live in you. Let the Lord live in you. Like I've read up... Uh, up ahead when the truth comes to you the word of God set yourself free because it gives you freedom set yourself free right here live in the Lord when you live in the Lord and the only way you can do that is by reading the word of God so you can understand how to live we wouldn't have we won't have to worry about these men he said that he is the vine and we are the branches if we live in him then we will have much fruit for without Him, we can't bear any fruit. So when we're living for the Lord, walking in the Spirit, we can bear much fruit. But then it also says, if you're not walking in the Spirit, you're not going to bear any fruit. Together as a church, we can grow. And our fruits will increase. But we need to be together as a church. Verse 20. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudeness of the world, why? As through living in the world, are you subject to ordinances? So it's saying right here, since we we since we died with Christ and then was raised again, when He resurrected, then we need to we need to be with Him and quit following the ways of men, their religious beliefs. We were dead with Christ, and when we died with Christ, like I said, the scriptures say we rose again with Him. When He resurrected, that was us being resurrected in a new life. We need to find a church of God. 
And there's churches of God in the Baptist church. There's churches of God in the Pentecostal church, in the Church of Christ. All, all these religions, they do have some churches that are churches of God. I'm not, I'm not going to stand here and tell you all the Baptist churches are churches of God. The churches of God are the ones who have a pastor who preach in the Spirit. Not by man-made uh, sermons. You know, there's some, there's some preachers out there that buy sermons so they can preach it to their church. That's wrong. A pastor does not buy sermons. A pastor's job is to read the Bible and let the Lord show him what his words say. Pastors who run the roads all the time and they're too, they just stay so busy. How can they get into the Word of God and teach us, the church, when they're so busy? Pastors should be quiet with the Lord, studying pretty much all the time. Because they're having to feed us, the flock. So when you find a pastor who's always doing this or always doing that and, and he's involved in all kind of stuff, well, you got to wonder, well, when does he have time to study the Word of God? The only reason I say that because I do know that there are preachers out there who buy sermons because they don't have time to study. This, this uh, teaching here, I'm, gonna be, I'm sure I'm saying things that are, people are going to be like, you can't believe I'm saying this, but it's real. And if it wasn't, I wouldn't be saying it. But like I said, I'm not here to satisfy any man. I'm, sat I'm here to satisfy the Lord. And I'm here to preach, to teach His words. His words, not the words of men. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into His death? Therefore we were buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. Now I read these verses because that's what I've been telling you. We were dead, but then we rose again. Verse 21 says, "Not Touch not, taste not, or handle not, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men. What the Lord is saying right here, why have all this? Why? Because it's going to perish. Their commandments, their doctrines are just temporary. They're just temporary. But the word of God is forever. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 13. It says food is for the stomach. And the stomach is for food. But God is going to do away with both of them. So those who are teaching what you should eat. What, what you should not eat. Or what did you drink. Or what you shouldn't drink. Right here it says, hey, it's going to perish anyway. Read the Word of God. This is what's going to last forever. The Word of God is not going to perish. This is, this is our life forever. Walking with the Lord, reading the Word of God, that's what's going to help you when temptation comes your way. Not what you eat or not what you drink or what you don't eat and what you don't. It's, that doesn't do it. Like I read up, up, up above in verse 23. Which things have indeed a show of wisdom and will worship in humility and neglecting of the body, not in an honor to the satisfying of the flesh. These teachings, they might make a person seem to be spiritual because it does require a person to be strong in their devotion on these rules. I'm talking about these rules of men. You know, this uh, not eating on the meat on a certain day. Uh, people are they're very devoted to that but again like I said these take that devotion that you're using to satisfy man take it and put it in your Christian walk and satisfy the Lord that's what we need to do with them there is no effect there is no effect when you need strength to overcome evil temptations by not eating or drinking I just keep saying that because there's there's religions out there that, that teach that, that do that. And there's a lot of people who obey that. I'm giving you the Word of God here. This is the Word of God I'm preaching. I'm teaching to you. Please open your hearts, open you, your spirits, and receive the words of the Lord. Chapter 3. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. 
For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. So right here he's saying, Seek those things that are above, which is, we're talking about the Lord. Seek the Lord's way, not man's way, not the world's way, God's way. That's what we need to seek things of. We need to go after that. Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. I am crucified with Christ. I am dead. Nevertheless, I live because of the Lord. Remember, He is the way, the truth, and the life. And He gives us life. John 18.36 We are in Christ's kingdom now, not the world. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 and 5. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. Let me repeat that. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. If you are born again Christian, if you are born again Christian, right here, this is for you. It says, if you're an, a born again Christian, you have overcome the world. A lot of us don't choose to, to, to live that way though. We don't choose to live this way. We, let the, we still let the world tell us what to do. And the rest of the verse says, And in this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Our faith in God, our faith in the Word of God, that's, that's what gives us the strength to overcome this world. So it says right here, if we're, God, if we're born of God, if we're Christians, we've overcome the world. Overcome the world. We have victory. We have victory over the world. And I'm reason on, on this this teaching, this teaching, when the Lord gave it to me, it's like, yes, Lord, yes, because I love my brothers and sisters in the Lord. I love them, and I I'm getting tired of seeing the devil show them other ways, telling them they need to do this or they need to do that. The the devil puts them back into bondage. The Lord has freed us from that. And I want to see Christians walk in victory. In victory. Because we can. Verse 5. Who is he that overcometh the world but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. We need to open our ears and hear the word of God. We need to open our eyes and see what is spiritual. We have the power in the Holy Spirit. We have it. But if we're not using it, then the world still has power over us. Only because we're letting the world have it. Not because the world is stronger than our Lord. Please, don't take this the wrong way because this is not at all what I'm saying. We need to stand on the Word of God and live it. Verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, and then shall ye also appear with Him in glory. Amen. When Christ, who is our life, Jesus is our life. There's no if or answer but there. He is our life. And when He appears... Then shall we appear with him in glory. Let me let me explain what this means. In Revelations 19, verses 11 through 14, it says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doeth judge and make war. Now we know we're talking about Jesus here. We know this is these verses are talking about the Lord. Verse 12, his eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a venture of dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. We have to be talking about Jesus. These verses are talking about our Lord Jesus. Because his vest vesture was dipped in blood. We're talking about his crucifixion. Now verse 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Now who's this army that followed him in these clothings in fine linen, white and clean? Well, we'll back up and read verse 8. Right above this, verse 8, it says, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. So this army is us. Because we're going to be raptured. The tribulation is going to go by. And then on the second coming, this is what it's talking about, 
when the Lord comes a second time, we will be with him on white horses. And I hope you understand what, uh, what I'm trying to say here. For those of you who don't understand, there's going to be a, a, a day of a rapture when the Lord comes for his people. They're still, the world's going to still be here, but he's taking his people out. And then for seven years, there's going to be the, the tribulation. That's when the devil's going to come and proclaim to be God. He's going to set foot on earth, and he's going to. That's when the Antichrist is going to be revealed. Now, after those seven years, then the Lord's going to come back. First time he came back and just in in the in the air. He didn't set foot on the earth. He was in the air, and he brought he took all his saints with him, the Christians. Now, the second time when he comes after the seven year tribulation, then he's going to set foot on earth. Now, that's what I'm talking about right here. We will be with him. When we leave with him on the rapture, we're going to return with him after seven years on white horses. So these armies that he's talking about, we are the army. So when it says up here, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. That's what it's talking about. We will return with him in glory. We won't be doing the fighting. We're his army, but we're not going to be doing any fighting. All we're going to be doing is watching them speak. Speak. The Lord is not even going to have to do anything physical. All he has to do is speak it and the things are going to happen. Praise God. That's how strong our God is. Verse 5. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil compasses, covetedness, which is adultery. So it's saying, so since you belong to Christ now, put away these things of the world. Which in Romans 6.6, 6, it says that the old man is crucified. Knowing this, that the old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, and that henceforth we should not serve sin. And some of these sins that we're serving, it speaks about sexual sins. That's what it's talking about up here, fornication, which is meaning pornography, prostitution, committing adultery. I mean, sex before marriage, that is, nobody looks at sin, as, that as sin anymore, except your born-again believers. It's pretty natural to have sex before marriage now. Where at one time, even the world knew it was wrong. But now the world doesn't look at it as wrong. And the other sin is not not being pure. Gun cleanliness. Mark 7, verses 21 and 22. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murders. Thieves, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness and evil eye blasphemy pride and foolishness so when you don't have a pure heart this is this is the way you're going to be this is the way the world is the world is like this the world is a back backstabbing place and that's all you need to do is during election time what do they do just about 90 percent of the time it's putting down the other guy is that the christian way no that's the world's way the Lord's saying, stay away from that. He's saying there's the, the stay away from the one of the sinful ways of living in the world is evil desires that we have. James 1, verses 13 and 15. I'm going to read this out of the Living Bible because it's a little bit easier to understand it. So I'm going to read it out of the Living Bible. And remember, when you are being tempted, do not say, God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong, and He never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. So what right here is saying, if right here, just having the desire, say lust, the Lord says, if you lust, you've committed adultery already. But right here, it's like, if you if you have that desire, if you're lusting, that's the next step. You're gonna you're gonna do the act. The Lord says, this is of the world. This is not the way we live anymore. Being greedy, He said, that's of the world. One of the Ten Commandments, Exodus twenty seventeen: Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's uh, house his manservant or his maidservant, his ox, and other things here he says. Anything that is na that that it's his neighbors. He says, Don't be greedy. Don't don't say, well the Joneses have it, so we need to get a bigger one or a better one. That's the way the world is. 
If the Jones have it, then we need to have it too. These are things of the world. In the flesh, we're always wanting more. In James 4, 2, it says, We lust and even kill for things we want. We fight and argue over it. This is a true saying. We lust and even kill for things we want. For example, let me give you an example. The love of money. The love of money, it can lead to, to uh, stealing. It can lead to cheating, like on your income tax. Or when you buy a car, you buy it for $5,000, and then you go to the uh, courthouse on, to pay the taxes, and you tell them you bought, it, you bought it for $500. And Christians do that also. Not just the lost world. Christians do that. Oh, it's not that bad of a sin. No, excuse me. Sin is sin. God did not put categories in sin. Oh, that's a little sin and that's a big... No, He didn't do that. Sin is sin. If you're doing this and you're a born-again believer, repent. Repent and stop doing it. Christians do this. So that's why I say for the love of money can lead to these things. Now, I'm not saying money's bad. Money's good. We need money. But it can lead to these things if you allow it. If you're not walking in the Spirit. If you're not walking with the Lord. And how do we do it? How can we do it? Like I've been saying, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Zechariah 4, 6. It says, not by might, nor by power. It's not by our might, nor is it by our power. But by the Spirit, saith the Lord. It's by the Holy Spirit that's in us. That we can do these, keep from doing these things. Live and keep from living like the world lives. Verse 6. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience which those of us who are Christians we pretty much know this already that the wrath of God is coming it is coming and it's coming to the children of disobedience meaning the lost people their time's coming right now we look at them we think man here I am living for Lord and here they got this and they got that and believe me one day their day is coming did they have to cheat to get these things are they living for the Lord to get these things no no they might have a good job right now and they have the money to buy these things but on Sunday because they have all these things these boats whatever are they living for the Lord are they going to church and praising God Mm-mm. it's because they got too many, too much material things to keep them away from that that's what the devil uses the devil wants you to have uh, rifles and stuff to go deer hunting or duck hunting or whatever uh, he wants you to have a boat so you can on the weekend you can go here and there you understand what I'm saying? These these things seem to be very pleasurable. And they can be. But nine times out of ten, it takes you away from the Lord. I'm not saying Christians can't have these things. But don't let it take you away from worshiping the, your God. Romans chapter 8, verse 18 and 19. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifested in them. For God has showed it unto them. Lost people know. They know there's a God. But they choose. They choose to ignore. To ignore that there is a God. Or if they say, oh, I believe in God. They choose to reject them. Because they don't want to. They don't want to give up self's, self's pleasure. Oh, well, if I give my life to the Lord. Then I'm going to have to give this up and give that up. Well, if there's if it's sin, yes, but you know when you when you become a Christian, I mean, people act like, oh, now I'm a little dull life, uh, nothing to do. That is so untrue. When you become a Christian, you start living for the Lord. You have more life in you than you what you had before. Our God gives us life. We're living a different kind of way now because born again means you're living a totally different kind of way. What you thought was pleasure is no longer pleasure. Going out there and partying, that's no longer pleasure. Getting up with a hangover, uh, or getting an, an ulcer from drinking too much or whatever, cirrhosis of the liver, that's partying, that's, that's pleasure? No. Real pleasure is living for the Lord. Romans 2, five. But after thy hardness in the impotent heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteousness judgment of God. Because of their stubbornness and refusal, they are storing up wrath for themselves. That's what the Bible says. 
because they're living this way, this is what they're storing up for themselves. This is why we need to be out there witnessing to these people. We need to let them know. We need to let them know who Jesus is and what kind of victory and what kind of blessings you can have by living for the Lord. And if they refuse it, well, we need to warn them. Hey, there is a hell. There is a hell. It is for real. People joke about it. I hear jokes all the time about it. But it's nothing to joke about. It's for real. That's why we should be witnesses. And I know you have family, whether it be your mother, your father, your grandmother, grandfather, your cousin, your brother, your sister, uncle, aunt. I know everyone out there who has family that's lost. Now, if you love those people that are that's family, you need to warn them and quit listening to the lies from the devil. Because he'll give you every excuse there is to keep you from witnessing to anyone, not only family, but to your friends. I would rather have someone in my family or my friend dislike me. I'd rather them dislike me, but at least me telling them the truth than for them to like me and, and I know where they're going. This is for real people. Hell is for real. The wrath of God is for real. We know it and we should, ha we should have enough love for our family that we should warn them about it. Verse 7. In the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. He's just saying here, remember, we used to be in the same boat. Praise God. Praise God that we chose Him. That we chose Him to live for. Praise God. Because we used to be in the same boat. Remember that. So don't look down on those people. Well, look at them. Look at... Nah. -uh. We pray for them. Pray for them. Because we know where they're going. If they don't change their life, we know where they're going. So we, we should have some, a sincere heart after them. We shouldn't look down at them thinking, well, look how they live. Nah. -uh. Because we were once like that. You got that man that lives under the bridge or that wino. Remember this. The Bible says it's by the grace of God that that, that, that that is not you. It's by God's grace that that is not you. Because we were all, all of us, and before we got born again, all of us was capable of being that kind of person. Verse 8. But now ye also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. So the Lord says, put off, put off all these things, put off the old man, which if we're born again, that's what we've done. If you want to be born again, this is what you have to do to stop living this way, to stop living the world's way. Verse 10, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. If you're a born again Christian and you've become that new man do people see it being a Christian is a 24 7 verse 11 where there is neither Greek nor Jew circumcision nor uncircumcision barbarian satanian bond nor free but Christ is all and in all he's saying it doesn't matter what you are it doesn't matter if you're a Greek or a Jew doesn't matter if you're circumcised or, or not uncircumcised. In Acts 10.34, it says, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of person. God does not look at color. He does not look how tall, how small. He doesn't look how skinny or how fat. He looks at the heart, period. That is it. He is no respecter of person. So verse 12 Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also ye him. And above all things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. This is what people ought to see. When you're born again Christians, this is what people ought to see. A person who, who is meek. One who is long-suffering. Patience. One who is, has, has mercies. 
mercies. Not always wanting revenge when someone does us wrong. Forgiving others when they do do us wrong. We're not always fighting with people because we want to get our way. This is the kind of light that should be shining. But most of all this, he said above all these things, love. Love is the most important. We need God's love in us. We need His love. Not the love of the world. We need God's love. We need His love. So tonight, we've learned the things that we shouldn't be doing because that's the, world, that's the way the world does them. And then He's shown us things that we should do as being Christians. But mainly He's shown us, do not, do not get back into bondage by following the rules of men, the traditions of men. He says, do not allow yourself to go back there again. Because you were once in it, but now you have been set free. Now you don't have to worry about, well, should I eat this or not eat that? Or drink this or not drink that? Read the Word of God. That is our, that is our instructions for life. And this is, this is what sets us free.